So lovely to see you all. My name's Narelda Jacobs. I'm a Wajat Yungar woman from Boorooloo, Perth. I've been living and working here in the Eora Nation since 2020. Uh, you will see me uh, in the daytime on TV, at channel, on Channel 10, on Studio 10 and also the Midday News. And then on a Tuesday night, you might see me on The Point with NITV, which is a fantastic resource, a resource actually uh, during the referendum because we have uh, The Point referendum road trip, which is a, re a really really wonderful. Uh, this weekend we uh, we pre-recorded the show in Adelaide, so that's going to air tomorrow night. A really, really good show. I'd highly recommend you uh, you watching that. Well, before we get further into the formalities, we are on the lands of the Darrell people, and we have uh, Aunty Dolly here that is going to welcome us to country. Can you please give her a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you, Meralda, for that um, nice warm feel, hey? Um, so we're all here tonight, uh, of course, you know, we're all here for the one thing, so... Um, and I guess, you know, it's coming closer, um, getting closer to where we are and um, where we stand and, you know, we're walking together. So I think that, you know, it's a positive vibe. I'm feeling it. We're all feeling it. <laughs> So, um, so a little bit about me, um, I'm an elder, I live in the community, I have been for a long time. Um, my family walked and talked and played and done all those things in this beautiful Darawal country of ours that we all share. Um, and so I think that, you know, what not does bring us together as a, as a, a nation in walking together and talking together. But first of all, I'd like to acknowledge my mother. Um, she was a Dungari woman, also from the far top end. Her birthing place is um, Far Kempsey. My dad's a Ewan man. And my granny is a Darawal. So that's what brings me to where I am today. But I'd like to make a nice warm welcome to all you guys out there, um, especially my brothers and sisters and all those Aboriginal people that are joining us tonight and our, our non-Indigenous people, all our brothers and sisters um, also. So I'd like to make a nice warm um, welcome to you all, all you guys. So um, I'd like to pay my respects to all those past, present and emerging. Um, and as we do, we walk and we talk and we share um, the voice. So for me, I've been on this journey for a long time. Uh, Thomas and I and a few of us here, more beer, that, uh, that have been um, talking about the Illaru Statement of the Heart, which um, my heart has always been with my mob and my people. And the journey and the struggles that we've had um, I'm one of 16 siblings. My parents are here in the Waranora, in the Darawal area. They're here to rest. Um, I do have a few more brothers. So I have, I'm one of um, 11 boys and five girls. But um, my journey um, tonight is, is feeling very good and positive about what brings us here tonight and how we can make a difference, hey? So thank you. Thank you, Arnie Dolly Brown. I think we feel very welcome here on Darawal country and I'd also like to pay my uh, respects to elders past and present on Darawal country. Uh, their sovereignty was never ceded. Um, our first speaker, um, after that wonderful welcome by Annie Dolly, uh, has made uh, lots of sacrifices to be able to give you the information. Um, the, our two speakers actually ha have made more sacrifices than most. Uh, one has um, taken a break from making award-winning films uh, and uh, television programs that you've watched. Uh, the other gave up a position on the Shadow Cabinet um, to be able to make sure that you have the information that you need uh, to be able to cast an informed vote. Um, Julian, we might talk about your um, replacement a little bit later if the conversation goes there. Um, but can you please put your hands together for Member for Barawa, Julian Lisa.
Well, thanks so much, Neralda, and thank you, Auntie Dottie, for that beautiful welcome to country. And can I join you in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we speak and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm just going to put down that wonderful flyer and also my Coke can, which is uh, sustaining me after the long journey from Barara to, uh, to the Sutherland Shire. Um, uh, I know this is called the Shire. I like to think I represent the Shire or the Shires because I represent the Hornsby Shire and the Hills Shire in, in, in my electorate. Yes, your Shire would get booed or hissed in my electorate too, so don't <laughs> worry. I must have been the most unusual child because for my 10th birthday, unlike most normal people, I wasn't saying to my parents, give me a, a bike or give me the latest video game or give me a cricket bat. I said, I'd like a copy of the Australian Constitution. <laughs> I've previously described such behaviour as Nerdus Maximus. <laughs> uh, what I had discovered as a young boy is that we have a remarkable constitution. Um, we are one of the world's oldest continuous democracies. Uh, we should, as Australians, be very proud of, of that fact and very, be very proud of our constitution, which was written in Australia by Australians and for Australian conditions and rarely in the, in the time of the 1890s and still relatively rarely today, we as Australians got to vote on our constitution and we should be uh, very much proud of the fact and take the responsibility very seriously that we are having this opportunity to vote to change the rule book of our country. And I think that that's an important thing that regardless of where people sit in the debate, we should really celebrate. Now, when the framers of the Constitution got together in the 1890s, they put together the constituent parts of our country, which were the, the six colonies that sat around. But there was one group of Australians um, that they completely overlooked, and that was our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. Um, and so I think, um, in, in terms of what we are doing here in um, this referendum, we are completing the Constitution. We are completing the work of Federation. And what you are doing tonight by coming here is you are carrying on a tradition that began in the 1890s of people going to public meetings to hear speakers and to discuss constitutional reform in our country. And so you should feel a connection to those people and you should feel, as I do, that we are on a journey to complete our constitution. Now, I think it's very important in the context of this debate to look at what it is we're actually voting for. And it's one of the reasons that I encouraged um, the good organisers here. And I want to particularly acknowledge Jodie um, and the wonderful work that she and the, the other conveners of the Sutherland uh, for Yes campaign have done. <laughs> I met Jodie up at the Gama Festival and she stalked me the whole festival until I said yes to coming to do this. So, uh, um, and uh, as Jodie said, I'm, I'm noted as being a person of my word. So uh, when I said yes, I do it, I absolutely... Uh, Look forward to coming down to, to, to see you and to talk to you. And it's an honour to be in the presence of my friend Rachel Perkins, who you'll hear from a little later. But what I want to do, I want to actually take you through the words on the ballot paper and the words in the amendment, because there's a lot of interesting things that are being said about this referendum. And when you actually focus on the words, you realise what this is actually all about. So there's this very useful pamphlet here, um, that explains from Yes23, and there's also the one-pager from voice.gov.au, which, ex which explains what it is we're actually voting on. So if you've got this pamphlet, the question here is on the inside second page. That's what you'll see on your ballot paper. When voting starts, I think um, I'm right in actually 15 days' time. That's when the pre-poll will start, and then uh, um, you know, the referendum is fewer than 30 days' time now. So what you'll see on the ballot paper is the words, a proposed law to alter the constitution to recognise the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve of this proposal? And if you support the proposal, you write the word yes on the ballot paper. And if you oppose the proposal, you write, write the word no. And you have to write those words in English. That's the best and safest way to ensure that your vote counts. Now, some of my friends on the no case have said that this is the biggest change in the history of, Australian, of, of the Australian Constitution. Um, in the last referendum in 1999, when I, I was only wearing short pants, I was very actively involved in that referendum. I'm a very strong constitutional monarchist. That was a very big change that was proposed to our Constitution. In fact, there were 69 separate changes to our Constitution in the Republic referendum. But when you look at this change, this is one new section, just one. It's one of the smallest changes 
that have been proposed to our constitution. And I think it's important that we actually look and see what the what, what the what the words on the amendment actually say, because uh, when you look at the words, it actually removes a lot of the uh, uh, the misinformation and uh, um, interesting discussion that we're having on this publicly. So it's on the inside uh, right-hand page uh, on the Yes 23 pamphlet. It says, one, in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia. That's the recognition part. That's what Aboriginal people have been talking about uh, for almost a century when the great Yorta Yorta man, William Cooper, petitioned the King for recognition through seats in the Parliament. Um, this has been a, a long project. This is the bit that helps us complete the Constitution. One, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice. So that is the guarantee that there will be a committee comprised of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Constitution. That's the guarantee bit. Some people say to me, why do we need to have a guarantee that, uh, that, that this body will exist? And that is for two reasons. Number one, because when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were asked about what they wanted as recognition, they didn't say, we just want some flowery words of poetry. They didn't say we wanted something where people to be racing off to the High Court to overrule the Parliament. They said we wanted a body in the Constitution that would have some permanency. So unlike the many other bodies, it could be reformed, it could be changed, it could be overhauled, but there would have to be some body there in the future. Number two, this is the only function and power we're giving to the body in the Constitution. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to the Parliament and the Executive Government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So what does that mean? The body, the committee, may make representations, make submissions effectively, to the Parliament, and when it says capital P Parliament, it means the Federal Parliament, and the Executive Government of the Commonwealth, which is just a fancy way of saying ministers and public servants on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So we're recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first people of Australia. We're setting up a committee that's got a permanent home in the Constitution, and its job is to make representations to the Parliament, to the ministers and the public service. Number three, this is the bit where we work out the detail. The Parliament, that's people like me, shall, subject to this constitution, have power to make laws with respect to matters relating to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. So we in the Parliament will work out who serves on the voice. We in the Parliament will work out how the representations made by the voice are, are, are received. We'll work out... Um, what the functions of the voice will be, we'll work out what powers the voice has, we'll work out its funding, we'll work out all the usual things that parliaments work out when they're setting up institutions. Parliament remains supreme. So what we are guaranteeing in, in this referendum, it's an invitation from us, the parliament, to you, the people, to say to us, one, let's recognise Aboriginal people in the constitution, two, let's um, create a body that's got a permanent home in the constitution, it's going to be a body that advises us, and we, the Parliament, will change and adapt it from time to time. That is all the referendum is about. It's not about the Western Australian heritage laws. It's not about treaty. It's not about reparations. It's not about welcomes to country or dot paintings or anything else that the no case might tell you it's about. It's about setting up a body. Now, why do we need a body like that? Well, we need a body like that because this is, in my view, the greatest country in the world. When you look at all of the social and economic indicators, we perform at the very top uh, globally. But there is a gap between outcomes for most Australians and outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and it is a gap that it doesn't matter who's in government, it doesn't matter how much money is applied, it doesn't matter how much goodwill is there, the gap is not closing. And my long experience as a parliamentarian, um, in the entire seven years that I've been there, I have been involved in Indigenous policy, I have seen example after example after example of Indigenous people not being listened to on the policies and laws that affect them and, in fact, not even being consulted. So what we are establishing is a body that basically says the future has to be better than the past has been. That's what I like about this so much. It's practical. It's future-focused. It's not about the past. It's about making better policy in the future. And what do we know about that gap? Because it's a particularly bad gap. It's a gap that means that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a life expectancy that's eight years lower than the rest of the population. 
they have a suicide rate that's two and a half times higher than the rest of the population. One in two Aboriginal Australians live at or below the poverty line. So when some people on the no case say, oh, it's 20% of people in remote communities and everybody else is driving around in Maseratis, that's not true. One in two Aboriginal Australians sadly live at or below the poverty line. Um, we have a, a scenario where an Aboriginal woman is 30 times in this state more likely to be um, a victim of domestic violence than a non-Aboriginal woman. That an Aboriginal boy is more likely to end up in jail than in university. This is the gap that is not closing. This is the gap that means that we need structural change in the way that we make policy about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs because the gap is too big and what we've been doing in the past hasn't been working. So we've got to change TAC and that's, that, that's what this referendum is about. Now, we all know in our own lives that when you're consulted about policies and laws, you get a better outcome. We know this from just local planning issues. In, in my community, I have a series of um, progress associations. They're called the West Pennant Hills Progress Association or the Beecroft Cheltenham Civic Trust. They have annual general meetings and people, people get elected to them. Their job is to make representations sometimes to the state government, sometimes to me, but mostly to the council about development issues in their community. And I saw some of the beautiful pictures of your shire here and saw that there's been a bit of development going on and there'll be, from time to time, you know, organisations that will come and make representations to councils about the nature of the changes that people don't want to see in their areas. Sometimes the council will agree with the recommendations of my progress associations. Sometimes they'll reject them. And sometimes they'll cherry pick and say, we like this thing, but we don't like that thing. Whether the council adopts, rejects, or cherry picks, the decision is ultimately better for having listened to the local people who form the committee together. And the local people's voice is stronger for actually having those associations like the Progress Association or the Civic Trust there. The voice is no different. The voice is, is that um, those sort of bodies come to Canberra. Because what we're doing when we're establishing the voice is that we've got local, regional and national structure. What do we know? People say we don't know anything about the detail of the voice. We want to see more detail. Well, in both the official yes case and in statements from the government, we know some of the key details. We know the voice will be a body chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. They'll be chosen from the local and regional bodies in their communities. Half of the people on the body will be men and half will be women. There'll be spots reserved for people from remote communities and for young people because Indigenous populations are, are by, by and large younger than the rest of the community and there's particular issues um, for young people. We know that uh, the body won't have any veto power, that it will be advisory only. Uh, we know that it won't have any powers to make uh, um, decisions about funding or deliver programs and that, as the Minister has said, the first four items in its inbox will be closing the gap in education, employment, healthcare and housing. So when you hear about the submarines and about the parking tickets and about you know, the space program or whatever it is that they're supposed to be advising today, that's not true. Because one of the powers we have as the parliament is to set the priorities for the matters that we will receive advice on. And the minister's been clear that those closing the gap priorities are, are very important. Now, anybody who thinks that, that those closing the gap priorities can be solved in a weekend is kidding themselves. This is very substantial work uh, for The Voice, and it's very important work. I've given you an example of how consultation works in the general community. Let me say something to you about how consultation works in Indigenous communities. And I've seen when you listen to Indigenous people, you get a better result. I recently uh, was in Victoria and visited the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Sector. You know. Um, Aboriginal women, uh, like the rest of the population, sadly are susceptible to breast cancer. And the rates of breast cancer among the populations, whether it's Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, are pretty much the same. But the rate of death for Aboriginal women compared to the rest of the population is so much higher. So the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Sector got together Aboriginal communities and they said, why aren't women getting screened? Because that would make all the difference. And women said, Aboriginal women said to them, you know, hospitals are places of trauma and death for us. They don't, we don't feel comfortable in it. We feel, you know, doing a screening there, there's issues around modesty. So the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Sector decided they would change TAC. 
In 12 communities, they adopted a thing called the Beautiful Shawl Project, where specially, specially designed shawls were made for the women there. They had Indigenous motifs in them. Rather than women having to go into the, the clinical, sterile, traumatic hospital, the, the screenings came to them, and the women came out in drives to get screened. And if we're going to do anything about reducing the rates of breast cancer death in Aboriginal women, it's actually getting them screened in the first place. There's a great example of policy problem identified, listening to people on the ground, change and results. That's what The Voice will deliver for us. The Voice isn't the silver bullet. It's not going to close the gap in everything. It's not going to close the gap on day one. But it's an important policy tool that we can use to help make Australia a better and stronger place. And that's why I've been so passionate about, uh, about supporting it and it's why I'd encourage you to support it too. I come from a community which uh, in the 1967 referendum didn't exist. Um, two years later, our electorate was formed. And in 1967, Australians voted uh, uh, overwhelmingly. 90% of Australians agreed to give the federal government the power to make laws about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's hard to believe today 90% of Australians would agree on anything. I mean, uh, <laughs> we know they don't. I mean, they can't even agree on the time of day. In Queensland, they don't have daylight saving. And as we all know, the milk goes sour and the curtains fade for about six months of the year here when we're down south. But 90% of Australians on that day in 1967 agreed. In my community, the average was 95.4. People in Liberal electorates tended to vote much in a much higher numbers in, uh, in, in that particular referendum. And I'm proud, to that. I'm proud of that fact, and I've charged my community with beating the national average again. Sadly, I don't think we're going to get a 90% result, but I think we are going to get a good result. And I keep being buoyed by the fact that uh, uh, every day, every week, people are coming to my office and volunteering. Just before I, uh, I, I wrap up, because I could say I'm getting wrapped up, I wanted to, to just uh, hit the key argument of the no case, because I think this is really important to think about. The no case says that this is a racially divisive idea, this voice. And this is an argument that I fundamentally disagree with. It's why I decided to make the decision I made and to come out and campaign yes, because I just don't think it's based on the facts. In 1901, the framers of the Constitution put in the Constitution a power to make special laws for the people of any race for whom it's deemed necessary to make special laws. Between 1901 and 1967, Aboriginal people were excluded. From 1967, and that's, that was what that referendum was all about in 67, 90% of Australians voted to give the Commonwealth the power to make laws about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as well. Since Federation, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the only people we have ever made laws about on the basis of their race. We've never made laws about Greek Australians or Italian Australians or Chinese Australians or Indian Australians or Jewish Australians or Hindu Australians or Muslim Australians. But we have made laws about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and they are the only people we make laws about. Race has been in the Constitution from day one. We've had those separate laws for Aboriginal people since 1967 and the fruit of those laws is the gap that we see today. This isn't about division, it's actually about closing the gap and bringing us all together. And that's what I want you to think about as you go to the polling booth on the 14th of October. Thank you. Oh, Julian, Lisa. So I take it that's already given you a lot of information, perhaps that you didn't already know before today. Um, he has a way of cutting through the noise, doesn't he? That has just sliced through the noise just to present the facts of, uh, of what you're going to be voting on. Um, somebody else who's going to be doing that is our next guest. As I said, uh, we're hearing from two people who have sacrificed uh, a lot this year to be able to provide those facts. Uh, Rachel Perkins has put down her tools as a filmmaker. Um, 
well, she she picked up a trophy. The, she picked up a logie in uh, in June or July uh, for the great for, for the Australian Wars. Have you, has anyone seen it on SBS? An incredible three part documentary series, uh, the the Australian Wars. You could also catch um, Rachel and I yarning in a very special episode of Compass. Uh, it's called Come Together uh, on the ABC. You can catch it on ABC iView. The repeat is going to be shown uh, in... I think the repeats are on a Sunday morning and you'll be able to see that the Sunday before the referendum. But, look, you don't want to hear from me. Let's hear from Rachel. She is the co-chair of Yes23. <laughs> dedicating her life this year to leading campaign. Rachel Perkins. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... I feel like I have to stand up here and address you because Julian's done that, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that too. Um, uh, I really appreciate you all coming out on whatever day it is I can't remember because um, it's just been so busy. Um, but thank you for giving up your time. Um, uh, we're going to have a panel in a second, I think, and um, I suppose what I'd like to say about the context of this evening is that really appreciate a, a variety of views um, I am involved with the Yes campaign, but I really appreciate hearing other perspectives and those perspectives must be respected um, and acknowledged. And so if anyone's feeling a little uncomfortable because they might be a no person or they might be undecided or whatever, I just invite you to feel comfortable in this space and be able to put your views and your views will be heard and, and respected and in the way that um, the best conversations happen. Um, can I also talk about respect in relation to Julian? Um, when the Liberal government get back into power, as ultimately they will at some point, I really hope you are the Prime Minister. <laughs> because you just, your integrity just shines through. Um, and the fact that you have sacrificed your position, a senior position, um, in the front bench because of your um, deep thinking on this issue that is not swayed by political motive or personal gain. It's, um, it's about the gain for the country and that decision um, just... Uh, we were so humbled, I suppose, to have a man of your seniority stand by us in this very important moment. So I may have to join the Liberal Party if you become its Prime Minister, <laughs> its, its leader. Um, I've never joined any political party, I'd just like to say, um, but I was very impressed by that. Um, so I am, um, I am a unique Australian like all of you. I have Indigenous heritage, Kalkadoon from Mount Isa, Aranda from Central Australia, which is the heritage line I follow. And then my mother um, is from uh, German farmers uh, from the back blocks of South Australia. And then I've got a bit of Irish thrown in too, which is what I put down to my showbiz style <laughs> and gags. Um, so, yeah, a bit of Irish minor back in the 1880s came to Central Australia. So a, a unique combination. Um, and uh, But I suppose I, I follow the Aboriginal line most strongly um, because um, that is the cause and that is the people who uh, you've had it described to you who um, have continued to be at the bottom rung of the ladder in Australia. And uh, so today I'm not, you know, I'm not an activist or a politician particularly, but I'm just standing up here um, trying to share with my fellow Australians um, why I think this is... Uh, proposal has has merit, and much of the um, logic of this proposal has already been um, well described by Julian. Um, but I think uh, I might just give you a perspective um, on where Indigenous people sit on this question, because we see in the press um, a lot of um, uh, debate amongst Aboriginal people. And, of course, the press. I work in the media, so I know that conflict, drama... Drama is conflict and that gets eyeballs and uh, clicks these days. But, actually, there's huge consensus from Indigenous people on this issue, although you wouldn't necessarily know it. And whilst I respect 
uh, Indigenous peoples' views to disagree um, on both the left-hand side of politics, the right-hand side of politics, I want to emphasise to you that the majority of Indigenous people support this. Now, how do we know it? Well, polling tells us this, and obviously polling can't be representative of every Indigenous person's view in the country. Um, but uh, the polling has consistently shown over 80% support um, from Indigenous people for this proposal. And indeed, um, this proposal has been around for a long time, the idea of constitutional recognition. It first came up with Indigenous Australians in a really concrete way in 1995. This idea of constitutional recognition, and my father and other Indigenous leaders were involved in that. So it's been a concept that's been around for a long time. Aside from the polling, we also know that um, where we have representative Aboriginal organisations, which are democratically elected representative bodies, so the land councils, what we call the land councils in Australia, um, all of the land councils on mainland Australia support this proposal. So um, in New South Wales, that's Newswalk, New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council, where I'm from, it's Andiliakwa Land Council, Northern Central and Tiwi Land Council. All of those are grassroots, democratically elected Aboriginal organisations. We also know that the Torres Strait Islander Regional Authority supports this um, idea. So when you hear that this is all elites like Rachel Perkins, and uh, Noel Pearson and Marcia Langton and it's just doing it, it's just them that believe in it. Actually, that is not factually correct. It is an easy um, suggestion to make. But actually, we are here representing our people. So when I'm on stage here with you, although I'm wearing a nice silk dress because I want it to look nice for you tonight, um, I am speaking on behalf of the people of Central Australia and the Aboriginal people of Northern Territory who overwhelmingly support this through their representative bodies. So I'm standing here just as one person, but thousands and thousands of people from Central Australia support this proposal. My people from Central Australia support this proposal. My people who are the ones who are talked about often, but not talked to. We support this proposal. And why do we support this proposal? Well, we have had government policies made about us for so long without us and we believe that those policies would be better informed, as Julian has described, if they had the lived experience of our people and the research that we bring to the questions of our challenges based only not only on our experience but the experience internationally. Um, we believe that these things combined with the knowledge of our local cultural circumstances if we had the opportunity to bring that wisdom to the table and to be heard, the people that design those programs and policies would be better informed by that advice and they would therefore roll out better programs, policies and ultimately laws when they make them about us. And I think everyone would agree that listening, listening to the people who you are doing the service for works. When you go to the doctor, the doctor listens to the patient. It helps them make the diagnosis. It's a fundamental cornerstone of program design and we know from an evidence base that that works. And that is what the voice is asking for, to be listened to. Now, I grew up in a unique situation. My father was in the Department of Aboriginal Affairs for many years. Now, he set up the first voice it was called the National Aboriginal Consultative Committee and it was set up in 1973. They had elections, they had uh, a national representative body, uh, they had a charter, they spent uh, so much time and effort and so much hope was put into that body and within five years it was closed down because of a change of government. So then they set up another one. It was called the National Aboriginal Council. And then the government changed and they set up another one. And on it went. We've had now had, in my lifetime, five of these advisory councils and they are established and gotten rid of uh, with a change in pol political leadership. And so you can imagine that how frustrating that is um, to be an Indigenous leader and kept creating these bodies and having them destroyed. So all of that capital, all of that knowledge all of that expertise, all of those resources that's put in, all of that hope, all of that effort that goes into setting up these bodies to have them crushed. 
So that is why Indigenous people have asked for the guarantee that there will always be a voice because we are beyond tired of them being set up and destroyed or, as we've had in the most recent iteration, government just picking the people that they would like to hear from, which we find is constantly the challenge in Indigenous affairs, that they will not listen to the people apart from the people that they want to hear from. The other thing, uh, the other problem we have with our democracy, of course, is that, you know, we're 3.8% of the population. So with most people, um, you know, uh, who aren't having laws made about them, that's sort of fine. But when it's us having laws made about us, our political power, we have no weight. Our vote doesn't really count. We're a minority. So that's why we need the Australian people to give us a voice. Because only you can give us a voice through voting yes at a referendum. Because when you stand beside us, suddenly our voice has respect. Because politicians respect the Australian public and their wishes. That's what gives this voice power. So some on the progressive no side would say it's not enough. You know, it's just an advisory body. But it has a power because it's constitutionally enshrined. One, it has the Australian people standing literally beside us saying, you must listen to this voice. But two, it's enshrined in the highest legal document in the land. And that gives it respect. And to be honest, that respect has been lacking towards Indigenous people in the Australian political sphere from the beginning of the Constitution. Finally, I think we are getting to a point where the First Nations people might be given that respect. But it's not just about us. Having the recognition of all of this culture and history and human, human life on this continent, it is part of the Australian story. Right? It's a deep part of the Australian story. 65,000 years, two and a half thousand generations. That is the foundation of Australia that we are all part of because we all live in this land and we are a continuation of the human experience in this continent. Our lives are bound together by being in this country together. It's our home. Now, having the highest legal document say that Indigenous Australia is part of this country, that, that acknowledges that deep time and our identity as Australians. And that's something for everybody. That's something that makes us unique in the world. It's why when you go to New Zealand, you, you know, you see pa the Pakeha, they're called, with this bicultural identity. They don't shy away from their Maori roots. It's part of what makes them New Zealanders. And every time I go there, I'm so enthralled about how woven it is in the fabric of their nation. We, we are nowhere near that yet. But constitutional recognition at least acknowledges that it's part of our history and that it's part of who we are as Australians. And I think that's something, not just for us now, but it's for our children and their children and those to come, that they don't have to feel like that's not part of their country or it was never recognised. You know, they can feel that it's part of them. And I think that is a profound change it's not something that's easily identifiable, it's not something you can measure, but it's a change to our hearts and the way we see each other. It's going to be a change for Aboriginal people, deep change for us, because all our lives we've felt like that that is part of Australia that no one ever wants to acknowledge or, or, or talk about or, uh, you know, it's like a foreign country, you know? It's like another world. It's like that's something that's not Australian somehow. So to have that brought into our constitution and to have the nation feel proud about that, proud enough to place it there, that will make a huge difference to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be acknowledged in that way. So I'm hoping that that will come to fruition in 28 days time. <laughs> Um, I might stop talking now. Um, I could talk all night. <laughs> I warn you, but I will not do that. Because um, we're going to have a panel, because we're going to make this a discussion, aren't we, too? Between them and uh, everybody and us. Okay, I'll shut up and sit down. Okay.
All right. And I'm going to ask Julie and Lisa to come back up again. And, um, and we can have those pretty pictures projected on the back screen now that we're sitting down, because like, I think that's kind of nice and soothing for the background. I think um, I'm looking at the future Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister of the country, <laughs> but I don't know Do which is which. make me the pro Deputy <laughs> Prime Minister. <laughs> yeah. It would be chaos. You can fight. This means you should be the Prime Minister. Yeah. So. <laughs> don't you agree? Don't you agree? Um, <laughs> that was just fabulous. And we haven't even got to any questions yet. Um, Rachel, there are 17 million eligible voters in Australia. Have you, by, by, the, by the time I've October 14... About, uh, I've yeah. spoken to about 5,000 of them, yeah, but I will get to 17 by the, yeah, hopefully in 30 days. <laughs> All 17 million of them. What's, what's the overwhelming thing that they say to you um, after each, uh, each time you speak to them? What, 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 was the, what was the thing that had the most cut through or, or what was their burning question that you, that you were able to just answer in one, in one fell swoop? Well, most people don't understand what it is, I think. And I would say that that's a very reasonable um, thing to do and people should be comfortable in not knowing. And I think a lot of people are just turning their minds to it now. And, like, I didn't know anything about the Constitution. I'm like him, uh, who, like, didn't you read it when you were, like, 10 or something? You did, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so, yeah, I've only really dived into it because of this. Um, so, uh, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily expect others to do so. Um, there are those, I think, who find that they are just closed to the proposal. And, but I think that they're closed to the pros proposal, but they don't have the facts, unfortunately. And I think there's a, a, there's a lot of those people who aren't going to move even when they're presented with the facts, mm. unfortunately, because they've, they've, things have leaked into their mm. minds. Did, now and did, did Marcy say set. that that was about 20 percent? Oh, look, I think what you, uh, I don't think that was based on. I'm not saying any facts and figures. And I think yeah. that's very anecdotal. Um, so there's there's those people, and they won't take a leaflet from me at the train station. Um, then there's those people who have no idea that there's a referendum on um, at all, which is still a lot of people. And there's people who are undecideds. Mm. And then there's people who are just really uh, yes. Yeah. So, and even people who are really yes, they might not understand, they're just yes. <laughs> so, and, and then are, yeah. there, are there a lot of people that, that, that go, oh, is that, Ill? is that all? Is that all it is? Were, were a lot of you like that tonight after you um, learnt, or after you heard Julian and Rachel? A lot of you were like, oh, is that all it is? What, what's all the fuss about? Well, I think there's some people too who, do, who like, you know, because people have said, oh, well, there's, there's heaps of organisations around already that do this. And when, like, just yesterday I went in to look at a house and the real estate agent was like, so you come in here and tell me about this because I lent him my yes hat to wear because he was in the sun. And um, he said, so what about NIA? What about the National Indigenous Australians Agency? Like, aren't they? Like, don't they do the voice? Mm -hmm. And I was saying, well, no, because they're actually an arm of government. Mm -hmm. They follow um, policy set down by the minister for Aboriginal Affairs, which might change from time to time, but they have to follow government policy. Mm. What the voice is, is independent from government, grassroots representatives coming up and giving advice independently to government. And he was like, oh, I didn't even know that. So there's things like that, that people are just getting their heads around. And what he said to me is like, it's just not explained to us. We don't understand it. It's just not explained to us. And a lot of us are voting no because we don't know what it is. Mm. And so, you know, that's a challenge because to explain it, you have to, like, come here and have these conversations, right? It's an extended conversation. Yeah. Yep. So that is, the, that is our great challenge. Can I add something? The reason I wanted everybody to have these is because they make a great placemat at your next dinner party. <laughs> and you will have the most stimulating dinner conversation because it's the best way to get people to have a look at what we're actually voting on. And I think when you see what we're actually voting on, you'll see it's not all the scary things that people have been told it is. And even if you don't start from the perspective that it's scary, at least you've done your duty, which is the duty the framers of the Constitution gave to all of us, which is to get informed about changing the Constitution, whether we wanted to support that change or not. So take this away, photocopy it, and use it as your placemat. Can, can I ask yeah. you a question? So what do you think of this... I mean, you know... What do you think of this no... If you don't know, vote no? Because I, I find that... I'm, I'm with you, Rachel. I, I think it's a dereliction of a duty that we have as Australians. We are so fortunate to have the opportunity to have the say about what the nation's rule book looks like. And it's our duty as citizens to get informed. And it's, it doesn't take long to get informed. Um, 
this is obviously a pamphlet from Yes 23, but there's the pamphlet that's come from, from the government that's there that just sets out the detail, as this does too. And at least if you're going to go and make a decision, an important decision that affects all of us, um, you should know what you're voting on. So I think it's, it's not that hard. It's not like the Republic referendum, where basically the whole constitution was kind of... Uh, had things crossed through it and, you know, there were lots and lots of moving parts. This is a really straightforward, small change. Julian, if we look at Canberra just for the moment, Parliament uh, has finished sitting now. There's not, not going to be any more sitting weeks before we go to the vote. So are we likely to hear less from politicians? Uh, and what do you say about all the confusion that's been thrown? Um, and and I, I speak of, you know, well, we, we saw the National Party out in force at the National Press Club supporting uh, Jacinta Nubajimpa Price. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, mistruths in that um, presentation. Um, so, are we going to be hearing less from politicians, do you think, before the vote? Well, Narelda, this isn't about politicians. Um, I'm not on the ballot paper. Jacinta Price is not on the ballot paper. Anthony Albanese is not on the ballot paper. Peter Dutton's not on the ballot paper. It doesn't matter who you usually vote for at elections. I mean, I'm a Liberal Member of Parliament. There are a number of Liberal Members of Parliament that are supporting this, including um, one of your local members here, the leader of the Liberal Party in New South Wales, Mark Speakman, who's not only the leader of the Liberal Party in New South Wales, but he, I think he was the youngest person ever appointed senior counsel. So he's a great lawyer and he's a Liberal and he's voting yes. Um, so you don't have to be a Labor or a Greens voter to vote yes. You, you can be a Liberal and vote yes. You can be a person of no politics and vote yes. This isn't about politicians. It's not about political parties. It's not about which tribe you support or which footy team you support, or which religion you are. It's about words on a ballot paper. And it's about words in the Constitution. And that's really, if you take away no other message from me tonight, it's look at the words. Mm -hmm. Do you think they'll, they'll be helpful? Do you think they give us the flexibility to move forward? Do you think um, this will result in helping we, the parliamentarians, who need the help uh, to make better policy? If you think the answer to that is yes, write yes on the ballot paper on the 14th of October. There is a lot of uh, noise, though, um, and there's a lot of politics in the noise. Uh, and I noticed on one of the one of a placard, one of the placards that the that the no well, at a no event, it was um, in in writing. It had Labor's plan, say no to Labor's plan. Is is this the government's plan? Is this a, is this the Anthony Albanese's plan? Is this a government plan, Rachel? When, when people say um, well, Anthony Albanese's plan, Linda Burney's plan, uh, the, the same sort of sentiment as uh, as Julian was saying. Well, actually, Julian probably should answer this question um, because he's been intimately involved with the development of the idea. Um, it, it is true to say that, uh, as I've said, 80% of Indigenous people support it, all our organisations support it. It, it. it was overwhelmingly supported through a very meticulous process of 13 regional dialogues with over a 1,000 Indigenous people discussing in three-day forums about civics and history and what they wanted for those 13 regions. Um, then all elected people to go up to the Uluru Convention and then at Uluru, the Uluru Statement was drafted and completed and endorsed by more than 250 people. Um, seven people walked out, but they walk out of many meetings. They're sort of... That's their thing. Um, although I admire many of those people, they, they, that's their relationship to that sort of situation. Um, so an overwhelming majority. So in that sense, and it was a request to the Australian people mm. rather than the parliament because it was our, we've vested our hope in governments before in petitions and statements and they haven't come to fruition. So this one was written to the Australian people very purposefully. But it is true to say that this idea, this elegant idea of the voice came out of more than a decade's thinking by Indigenous advocates, constitutional experts um, and others. And this idea of the voice was drafted um, and then was put to Indigenous people and they considered that proposal and accepted that. So I think, Julian, you should talk about how it was devised. So before they got to that particular point at Uluru and through the dialogue process where Indigenous people considered this, Noel Pearson, um, in his extraordinary way, was trying to work out, we've got this problem. We've got Indigenous people that want to um, achieve constitutional recognition 
and we've got constitutional conservatives, people like me, who think the Constitution's great and are very suspicious about changes to the Constitution. What can we do to bring that group together? So he set about going round, talking to people who'd been involved in the no case um, for previous referenda and who had demonstrated a fidelity to the Constitution and an opposition to constitutional change. And he tried to work out what is it that make these people tick? What can we do to try and thread the needle? Um, and so what Noel said, well, what uh, Noel began to do was to consult with people like myself, like Professor Greg Craven, Professor Ann Toomey, like my friend Damien Freeman and others, and talk about what is it that makes people like the Constitution the way it is and what makes people concerned about change. The biggest concern about change is the issue of what the court might do to the words that it might get. And those of us who like the Constitution the way it is like the idea that Parliament, who we the people are able to control through elections, um, can throw out the Parliament if they don't like the decisions that the Parliament is making. We don't like the idea that judges, like those countries that have bills of rights, that judges will be able to overrule Parliaments. The previous proposal that was on the table was for a racial non-discrimination clause. You might say, well, what's wrong with, racial non what's wrong with having a racial non-discrimination clause? Most people are against racism. Most people would be against racially discriminatory laws. It's just that when you're working out who decides whether a law is discriminatory or not, it's not left in the hands of the parliament that we can get rid of if they've made the wrong decision. It's left in the hands of the courts. So we said to Noel, go away and think about something that works with the grain of the constitution. We're not a constitution of flowery statements. We don't have a constitution that's got a bill of rights. But it is a constitution that establishes institutions. And he went away and thought and consulted and came up with this proposal for an advisory body and worked on it with myself and others before Uluru, before the dialogues took place, because he could see there needed to be something that people from across the spectrum um, of, uh, of views on constitutional change could, uh, could embrace. So it's not my voice, it's not the Labor Party's voice, it's not even Noel Pearson's voice. It's a voice that has been developed by so many people over so many years. Um, and it's a voice that's been embraced, most importantly, by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the most extraordinary consultation that's ever occurred with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's really issue. great to have the Uluru Statement from the Heart there on stage because so that you can see this is exactly, exactly what we're talking about. There was years and years' worth of consultation just to, to, to get to that point where the signatures were. Um, Something that that we hear a lot is, um, you know, there's no detail. And th this was pretty early in the piece and it's, it's, it's a phrase that's stuck. There's no detail. Where's the detail? But, but when you hear this from, from politicians, and, and Julian, you said this in, in your presentation uh, tonight, that they're the very people who are going to be um, debating in Parliament the detail that, uh, create, that, that builds the legislation, uh, that builds the voice. Um, so... Are you sometimes infuriated when you do hear politicians say, but there's no detail? Because they are the elected members who sh who know full well why there is no detail and that they will be responsible for the detail later when it's legislated. Well, not putting the entire legislation in relation to the voice in the Constitution is a strength. Firstly, it would basically double the size of the entire Constitution such that you couldn't fit it in your pocket anymore. Uh, but secondly, it would concrete in a particular set of circumstances that were right for today, but would not necessarily be right for future times. Um, and we have some of that in the Constitution already. Take the racist power. If we were writing the Constitution today, we would not have a racist power, I don't think. So what this allows us as parliamentarians is the flexibility to adapt, to overhaul, to reform the voice as times change. I think the great benefit of the voice today is about focusing on closing the gap. And there wouldn't be a person in the country that doesn't want to see us close the gap. But the question might be, well, what do we need the voice for after the gap is closed? And the answer to that is that we'll always need the voice because we will always make laws about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, not because they've got a gap that needs to be closed, but because they're first Australians and because they've got a, spe a, a special place in our country. So there's always going to be laws about cultural artefacts and heritage protection. There'll always be laws like, about things like native title. Um, and whether it's closing the gap issues or whether it's those issues, 
we will make better policies and laws if we're actually talking to the people that are affected by them. That's why all the detail isn't in the Constitution, because we want to allow for the flexibility to adapt and change the body in accordance with circumstances. But can I say on that, which he's exactly right, which is why I should be Prime Minister, um, <laughs> the proposal that was developed by Marcy Langton and Tom Cowmer, so it's a very detailed report that um, the Coalition Government commissioned and it was submitted to Cabinet a couple of times uh, under Ken Wyatt's leadership. And that outlined, it's recommended um, 36 regions potentially um, around Australia, which would be the regional areas. And we need that sort of diversity because there's so much diversity within Indigenous Australia, from the Torres Straits, a completely situation from Redfern, for example. Um, so they have their different needs and interests and priorities. And then a national voice of 24, which would have a permanent advisory body um, of young people and people living with disabilities, as um, was explained. So it, 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 now that hasn't been accepted necessarily, um, but the model probably, the shape of it will probably be something like that um, because that's been a very well thought through, discussed, explored model um, that's been consulted with widely across the country and a lot of thought's gone into it. So that will be sort of similar to, the, I think, the shape of it because that's the required fit right now. But as Julian explains, it will change over time. So it's an advisory committee, if you like, made up of elected grassroots representatives from around, around the country. It was an invitation offered by First Nations people after many years of consultation. It's not the government's plan and it's not, uh, it's not a, a political body at all. It's, it's about um, outcomes for First Nations people. Um, this all kind of... Did, did this... Correct me if I'm wrong. Did this or did it not sort of kick off with the Malcolm Fraser government, with the, with the Liberal government in the in the Fraser days, where where he 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 um, the the NAC might. <laughs> Uh, there's a little bit of a story here. If you watch the Compass episode, you'll um, you'll find out all about it. My, my dad was in the NAC and um, and he travelled the country, much like the, uh, the, the the Uluru Dialogues, consulting people. And um, he was um, set on that task by by the Fraser government. Uh, and the result of this consultation was a plan for a Makarata that they presented, uh, or a Makarata or a treaty, which is also uh, the word Makarata appears in the, in the Uluru statement from the heart, which was then presented to the United Nations. Now, nothing came of that. That was in 1981, and that was under the Fraser government. So, Julian, can you kind of take us back over history with the Liberal Party um, into the origins of the reconciliation movement and, and the work that had been done to, towards treaties? And, and why are we so conservative now? Well, look, I, I want to just clarify a couple of things before, before I do that. Um, this is a beautiful document. It looks physically beautiful. The poetry is inspiring, but it's not on the ballot paper. I think it's actually really important to remind people that the Uluru Statement is not on the ballot paper. So many of the things that are contained in the Uluru Statement, some of my friends on the No Case like to sort of draw them in as a way of um, sort of confusing what this is about. The only thing that is on the ballot paper is the voice. It's really important um, that people focus on that. But in terms of consultative bodies, I and mean, probably Rachel's even better to do this because if I may say something about your late father, when I chaired a committee with Pat Dodson and we were thinking about, well, what would the voice look like? Um, this was the committee that recommended that there be the Calma Langton report. There was an image that kept coming up of your dad um, that was told to me by Pat Dodson and by Warren Snowden and by other people that appeared before our committee of your dad going into communities, community by community, and sitting on the ground in communities, listening deeply to the people about the sort of representative structures that they really wanted. And the fruit of his work was the architecture that established ATSIC. And whatever people say about ATSIC, um, and that's not what's on the table here, the process of actually listening to people and asking them what did they want, how did they want to be represented, how did you get things from the ground, um, up, to, uh, up to the federal parliament was a really important one. First Minister for Indigenous... So a couple of things about the Liberal Party and, and this because I think it's important that we Liberals reclaim some of our history in relation to this. The 1967 referendum um, was put forward under Harold Holt's government. Um, uh, Harold Holt, Liberal Prime Minister who, fo who followed Sir Robert Menzies. It was the Menzies government that first gave Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people the right to vote. Um, it was the McMahon government 
that established the First Minister for Indigenous um, Australians. Um, the Whitlam government, um, I think, established the NACC and the Fraser government established the NAC and the Fraser government, and I should say the three living Fraser uh, ministers for Indigenous um, Australians, Ian Viner, Fred Cheney and Peter Boehm, all support the yes case here. There are more Liberals who are, who are voting yes. Um, the Fraser government uh, uh, established the NAC and then it was the Hawke government that established um, ATSIC. And there was a, a, a big agenda that the Fraser government had in relation to things like land rights. It was the Fraser government that published the Northern Territory Land Rights Act and so on. So there's, there is uh, some important history that those on my side of politics have been involved in. And even John Howard, to his, to his great credit, in 1999 he put forward uh, a second question alongside the Republic referendum which also proposed for the symbolic recognition of Indigenous people among a whole range of other things uh, in the Constitution. And unfortunately, that, uh, that, that particular referendum failed. In fact, 60% of Australians voted against it, or more than 60% of Australians voted against it. So there has been a history, and in relation to this proposal, most of the reports were commissioned either by Tony Abbott, Malcolm Turnbull or Scott Morrison, the Referendum Council, um, the, joint, the two joint select committees, including the one that I chaired with Pat, um, uh, and the Calma Langton report were all developed during the period of Liberal government. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, we, we went to the last election with a, with a policy that said we support constitutional recognition when there's agreement on the, on the wording and it's got the best chance of success, and we support the rollout of the local and regional bodies. And... Mm. When you think about actually where the conflict is in, uh, between the parties on this, everyone supports constitutional recognition. Everyone supports some form of voice, um, both sides at the local and regional level. Uh, the question is about uh, the voice in the constitution at the national level. But I say, what is the point of recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the constitution if you're giving them a recognition that they don't want? Mm. You know, that's... Mm. It's... it's pretty useless doing that. Well, and, what, and what business does the federal government have in being involved in bodies that don't have some hookup between the local, regional, into the national? I mean, it's all very well to give advice at the lower level, but unless it's actually imp impacting decisions we make in Canberra, what's the point? Thank you very much, Julian, for that. I really appreciated. Um, I really, really did appreciate that. Um, Rachel, it just goes to show how long this has been in the making. So many Prime Ministers mentioned there. So many invitations, so many agreements, so many handshakes. Oh, and this is... It. It's so close now. It's only, we're only weeks away from the vote. That's That's been so hard fought. I know. I mean, all I can say is, I know. Uh, <laughs> because, you know... Uh, I look at this documentary that we talked about, a different documentary that was made in 1973 when uh, my dad and a whole lot of other people were setting up the first NACC, the one that preceded the one that your dad served on and all of them had like dark hair and, you know, they were middle-aged and um, they had such hope and uh, that they continued to then set up another one and then another one and then another one until finally the last iteration was not, you know, not elected by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It was just handpicked by government. And I don't know, we've just spent so much of our human capital and will and got our hopes so high um, just, just, just to give advice. You know, I just think that... Um, I'm not sure what what we'll do if it doesn't go through. I, I'm concerned about that. I think I think we can win. Mm. I think we have, you know, right on our side, and you see that in the thousands of volunteers that come out every day across this country. We're at forty thousand now. I mean, you you get only like ten thousand on at the party at an election. With this, is forty thousand. Is, is it the it's biggest the, grassroots campaign we've ever it seen? It is. It's the biggest yeah network we've ever had. But there are powerful forces aligned against us and, um, you know, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. So, anyway, yeah. but I am all for winning and yeah. that's why, you know, it's not winning, actually. I shouldn't yeah. say winning because yeah. it makes it seem like some sort of sports thing. It's, 
It's just all for like closure and unity. That's what I'm for. We do we do have a roving mic in in the room as well, but uh, you've got your hand up, so I'm sure you've got a loud voice if you'd like to. Um, oh, you, the microphone's being run to you. Oh, there. Thanks. Well, I'm certainly in the yes uh, camp here, but can you comment on the fact that one of the two major proponents or uh, opponents, I beg your pardon, of it are Indigenous people, Jacinda Price and Warren Rundine. It seems, uh, well, putting the negative side and yet that's, you know, the, the seemingly it would, in, uh, I know that there are great benefits for non-Indigenous people in getting the S vote up, but it seems like the main winners would be Indigenous people. Could you just make a comment on, on those two characters that are muddying the water so much? Well, I choose not to comment on them personally. I, I know them both. Um, in fact, for NAIDOC year in 2000, and when was it that we had women of the women with a NAIDOC nominee, you know? Because of her, we, we can. We can in NAIDOC. It was several years ago now. It was about five anyway, years ago. Anyway, I was Warren's favourite Aborigine woman that year. Oh. <laughs> so there you go. Oh. <laughs> So anyway, no, how, I'm just you making a joke. In, in well, what he, way? He put it on fa he put it on like Facebook on oh. Twitter. He's like, oh. I nominate Rachel as my favourite Aboriginal woman. I was oh. like, wow. <laughs> anyway, so that was nice. Um, but we disagree deeply about this. Um, I think that they see value. Uh, look, we all want our people to be in a better position, right? And I, I must believe that. And. Uh, it's about which route to get there. Now, both of them believe that getting into Parliament is the way to do it, you know, getting voted in, right? Um, but uh, the party system in Australia often uh, results in us being a political football between parties to be thrown around the chamber. And uh, it hasn't necessarily worked very well for us. It means that if you're aligned with the Labor Party, you know, you're out in the cold while the Liberal Party's in. Or it means that, you know, um, the Liberal Party are constantly, you know, having a go at the Labor... It, it's, just, it's just we are stuck in this combat between parties and, you know, um, our, our fortunes shift and change as the new ministers comes in. And so what we want is... And so they do believe that that is the way to... And it is a way. You know, we, do, we should have Indigenous parliamentarians. But we must have a way also for Indigenous people to be able to speak to government that's not through the party system, that comes independently. But I think if you look at, you know... Um, if you look at what they're saying and the extent to which they don't represent the majority Indigenous view, right? They are not representing the view of Indigenous people from the Northern Territory, for example, mm. who overwhelmingly want this. So what does that say about the accuracy of the voice from them if they are not representing the majority of Indigenous people? I will leave you to make your own conclusions about that. Um, Julian, is Warren Mundine angling for Maurice Payne's Senate seat? <laughs> That's a question you have to put to him. <laughs> and also, do you have any words um, to, in response to Jacinta Numpajimpa Price, your uh, replacement as Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians? Well, look, I, I supported Jacinta's um, appointment to that, to that particular role. Um, you know, I, I respect that there are... I've got two Indigenous colleagues in my party room, Jacinta and um, Sarah, Senator Karen Little from South Australia. I've got lots of colleagues who represent l large Indigenous communities and face their, their voters regularly and, have a, and bring a different experience to this debate to me. But I go back to, is this going to make a difference? Do we have a, do we have a problem? Yes. Do we need to change tack? Absolutely. Is this going to make a difference? Yes, it will. And will, is it a safe change? Absolutely. And they are the reasons why I am voting yes. And it's the reasons why I'm in places like Sutherland tonight and like Rachel travelling all around, around the country because I think this will make a difference. And it's not about my colleagues. 
uh, it's not about any politician. It's about all of us. And it's about all of us travelling a journey uh, and realising that the words are very safe and they'll do good. Yes, that's worth a round of applause. Um, something that Warren Mundine was saying on Insiders at the weekend, though, he talked a lot about treaty, treaties, um, which it seemed to knock this, the wind out of the sails of that argument that the voice is a Trojan horse for treaties, as if, as if there haven't been treaties being talked about now and being negotiated now and um, in the process. So does anybody have a... Would anyone like to talk about... Um, that, that whole argument that the voice is a Trojan horse for, for not just treaties. Treaties is one part, but also land tax, reparations, compensation, your backyard, you know, all of that kind of same fear um, that, that they're running on. You've probably heard Dean Parkin's great line about backyards. In the native title debate, uh, it was said, Aboriginal people will come and take your backyard. Uh, I don't know about you, I don't know anyone who lost their backyard as a result of native title. And he said, so this time we're coming for your front yards instead. <laughs> and that's, the, that, that, that's the nature of, uh, of some of these arguments. Um, I, I just go back, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer. My, my friend Peter Stevenson that I worked with uh, uh, back when I was a practitioner, is here. she's a much, much better lawyer than I am. But I always think uh, uh, it's great to actually look at the statute. When I was a young lawyer, I was taught, look at the statute, look at the words, because that's actually what we're voting on. There's no mention of treaty in, in there. In fact, there's actually not, no, not even a mention of treaty in this document either. Uh, this talks about a Makarata Commission and agreement making. So treaty's got nothing to do with this. This is about advice. It's also got nothing to do with making decisions about payments or land. It's advice. We, the parliamentarians, continue to make the decisions. If you like the decisions, you vote for us. If you don't like the decisions, you vote for someone else. Um, simple as that. Uh, this is advisory. It's about policy. It's not about treaty. It's not about reparations. It's not about um, laws in different states that you don't like. It's not about, um, you know, as I say, welcomes to country which, which seemed to enter the debate at one point. You know, it's not about anything other than setting up a body to advise us to make better laws and policy. Are there any more questions from the floor? Yes. I'm really concerned about our kids. Now, I've got grandchildren that obviously are Aboriginal. Their other grandmother is English. They are very fair. They can pass off the not being or acknowledging their Aboriginality. Um, I'm worried about the comments that they see on, on social media. How are we going to bring our kids down from this, you know? How are we going to protect them? Because yeah. some of these comments are so racist yeah. that they're really hurting. And I find I've got to debrief my kids, my grandkids, that they, they live with me. I don't know what the other ones, you know, that don't live with me, but they're lucky I debrief them, you know, that they've got me there to do that. Thank you very much for those comments. We really appreciate you making those. Can I say something? And yeah. Rachel will have a, 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 a more national perspective than I will, but I think a lot of those comments are, are, are backfiring on people because what they're stirring up, they're stirring up the innate decency of Australians who feel angry about some of the comments that they are seeing on social media. And they're calling Yes23, they're calling the local campaigns and they're saying... I can't let this go on. I need to be counted. I want to do something. And I've been involved in politics since I was 16 and I've never seen anything like this. The number of people who have of no politics but who feel passionately drawn to this as the right thing to do um, and feel that they, that, they want to, that, they, that they want to stand and be counted on this. And that gives me great energy and great hope and, uh, and great passion. And that is the opposite effect to what some of these keyboard warriors will have. If I, if I want to get upset, I read my social media uh, and, I, and I read my emails. If I want to feel what real people are thinking, I go door knocking and I stand on the train station and you get a very different view um, when you actually talk to real people, not the anonymous keyboard warrior. Have you been door knocking? Yes, I have, and it's yep. great fun. Is it? And, oh, it's, it, it is the best thing. Uh, you know, do you know the first thing is people are really relieved when they see you at the door because you're not trying to change their religion and you're not trying to sell them steak knives. Um, the, the, the other thing is that uh, um, you, know, you, you go with somebody who's done it before 
and, and you have a chat with people. And some people have made up their mind and you just say, well, thanks very much and have a good day. Um, and other people are, uh, have you know, made up their mind and they're going to vote, to vote yes and you say, tell your friends, will you have a sign in your, in your yard, would you like to join the campaign mm. because this needs you. And then the most valuable conversations you have are with the people who say, look, I'd like to vote yes, but... And then you show them prov the provision and you talk them through. And you don't have to be a constitutional lawyer to talk them through. You just need to go along to one of the Yes 23 training nights. Um, you know, there are almost as many constitutional lawyers involved in this as there were um, epidemiologists during the pandemic, frankly. Um, but, you know, uh, this is really about having a conversation with your neighbours and just understanding their hopes and their fears and, you know, presenting them with the facts, and when they see the facts, I think that makes a big difference. We have a question here, yes? Yes, uh, first of all, thanks you both for your very clear and powerful presentations, and if only a whole lot of the undecided people heard them, I'm sure it would make a big difference, and it's a pity that uh, they're not. But Julian, I was just gonna ask you a question. The, you mentioned how really quite small this constitutional change is and you compared it to the Republic referendum of 1999. A friend of mine recently made a very good point in a little paper he wrote and circulated around. The 1967 referendum was actually a much bigger change than what is being proposed in this voice referendum because it gave the Commonwealth power to make laws for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. That was a much more major change in the Constitution. And I think this, this is a point actually worth making uh, more widely because, as you rightly said, 90% plus of those who voted, voted yes, and they were voting for a much bigger change than they're being asked to vote for now. I think that's a great point. No one in 1967 was saying, I'm not going to vote for this because I don't know what sort of laws they're going to make as a result of them. I don't know the details. We want the full details of the Native Title Act. We want the full details of the um, Land Rights Act. We want the full details of the Heritage Protection Act. No one was saying that. And had they said that, we probably wouldn't have had the 1967 referendum. It was different times, different place, in fairness. But, you know, that's a good example of the fact that, you know, um, Australians were prepared to, um, to back a change to the Constitution which they saw was necessary. And what I'd say is things are worse in some respects than 1967 because of that gap. And we can't... I, mean, I just want you to think for a moment, if the no case gets up, what have we foregone here? We've foregone the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And don't think this is going to come again quickly. In the Republic referendum, some of my friends who are Republicans said, oh, yes, vote no and we'll, 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 get, a, we'll get another shot at this. I'm very pleased it's been more than a quarter of a century and no, no more Republic referendums. I don't want another Republic referendum. But um, this is not going to come around again quickly. Um, this, is our, this is our chance. And more importantly, it's our chance to do something, something important, something that's not scary, to close the gap. And on the day after the referendum, if this does go down... We've lost the opportunity to recognise. We've lost the opportunity to put in place a mechanism that will help parliamentarians and will help us close that gap. We have a question in the middle. Uh, I just wanted to ask for some of the younger people that weren't around in 1967. Um, do you have a sound bite on what the 1967 referendum was about mm -hmm. and how it sort of relates to this when people raise that as an argument for yes or no kind of thing? And if the... The response is, do some research, have a look at this website. I'm more than happy with that. But just wondering if that... Because it has come up in some dialogues that I've heard. Yeah, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong on this. Well, I don't know about that. Um, so there's something called 5126, Section 5126 in the Constitution. And it is called the Race Power. And previously, in 1901, it had... Uh, it gave the Commonwealth the ability to make laws about any the people of any race except Aboriginal people. So it meant that all of the laws that were being made about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were done by the state and state governments, basically. And so genius Jesse Street, uh, who was a, a, an amazing figure, had the idea that a lot could be changed um, for the plight of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders if the Commonwealth took more responsibility because a lot of the state 
laws were very discriminatory in Queensland, Northern Territory, other places, very discriminatory. So in giving the Commonwealth powers, um, that enabled them to override and, and set a standard for laws. So um, the referendum was principally about that, about enabling Aboriginal to be inserted into the constitution um, in, ter in terms of the race power. And it was also, also about counting Aboriginal people in the census who hadn't been counted until that point because of tax provisions um, in the arrangements of the original document. That was less significant perhaps than the changing the race power. So now the Commonwealth, those laws that um, Julian was mentioning, the Native Title Act, Aboriginal, Heritage, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act, and other acts are made, not all of them under that power, but it does give the Commonwealth to make powers in relation to Aboriginal people. So very important change. And there wasn't a no campaign in Yes, it had bipartisan support, yeah. There wasn't a no campaign. If there was a no campaign, imagine all of the confusion that would have been thrown on those amendments. Uh, but because there was not a no campaign, there was none of that mud that was thrown. And so... The sky didn't fall in, <laughs> like just like marriage equality, the sky didn't fall in, the sky didn't fall in the 67 referendum and all of those other changes, uh, those sort of little known changes. Um, we, yeah, and all of those things. Just because there was not a no campaign, you don't have all of the fear that runs people. Did you have another question? No? Well, who, who's got the microphone? Rachel, thank you. That was what I was just about to say. There was bipartisan support in 1967. But I'd like to direct a question to you, Julian. You're very clear as a lawyer that we look at the words and they're, as, they're very simple, they're very straightforward. My understanding is that there's a significant proportion of people in our parliament who have a legal background. So how come they can muddy the water so much how come they don't know the basic legal principle is that they look at the words, particularly when you're holding a position of someone like the Shadow Attorney General? And the other comment I'd like to make, or we'll ask you to make comment on, my understanding is that to have a voice in the Constitution, we have to go to referendum, and under your government, your government would not take us to referendum. Albanese thought he was doing the right thing by giving us, the people, to whom the invitation is addressed, the right to say yes or no. So it's not Albanese's referendum, it's our referendum. I think when you read the... Some of you will have already thrown it out, but a few weeks ago you got a pamphlet from the AEC with a 2,000-word yes case and a 2,000-word no case um, that got sent to every Australian household. I'm really proud of the yes case. I was proud to be one of the uh, members of parliament that authorised the yes case. I think it makes the most succinct arguments for the yes case. I think it's a really good document. What's interesting in the no case is there's lots of lawyers quoted in the no case but none of the lawyers, except one who's actually voting yes, is quibbling with the provision at all. That's really interesting. What that says to you is that there's no problem with the provision. The provision is actually safe. And when um, you read the main arguments of the no case, they're about this is divisive, um, or this is uncertain, or it'll lead to people coming for your backyard, or what have you. It actually has nothing to do with the provision, or it'll lead to treaty. It's got nothing to do with the provision. And we as Australians should take comfort from that because if the provision was a problem, that would be the focus of the no case. But it's not. And that, to me, says this is safe. And that's why, other than my very long involvement in this that uh, goes back to my participation in the Constitutional Convention back in 1998, where I moved a motion that we had a second referendum to recognise Aboriginal people alongside the Republic referendum, the combination of my personal history and my sense that you know, even though I might quibble with the process that the Prime Minister had run here, at the end of the day, the, w the, the process doesn't last beyond the referendum, but the words last, and it's the words that are important. It's why I keep coming back to the words, and I keep coming back to what are the words designed to do? They're designed to help us make better policy. In some respects, this actually isn't about Aboriginal people, although the recognition part's very important. It's actually about 
making Canberra make better policy. It's actually about us as citizens saying to Canberra, you've got this stuff wrong, you need to change tack, you need to do a better job, here's a way you can do a better job. Thank you for that. Um, Ani Dolly, I think you've got the mic, and this is a nice way to end, actually. You've got the last question. I do have um, the mic. Um, so, um, look, I was 10 years old in 1967. I do remember very clearly um, about the way uh, that unfolded. And I tell you what, it was quite a, uh, a shocker. Um, look, I know that uh, my parents um, were never allowed to go to school. They couldn't read and write. They had, a, they had a lot of struggles through their journey in just being where they were in country. Um, but um, like I always say, my mother's 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 mother's, they all had voices. They were never allowed to use their voice. And I feel today I have a voice and I'm surely going to use it in a way that it is a positive vibe. Um, so... Uh, you know, getting back to being able to vote, um, being... being um, cos I, I think when I was born I wasn't a human. So, um, you know, thinking about all those things too, you know, it kind of puts you in a, a nutshell where you think, you know, I do have a place here. I do, I do have the rights to be where I am. I do feel like I am part of this country. Now, why hasn't this country moved forward? Thank you very much, Arnie Dolly. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming out. A big thanks to the Sutherland Shire for hosting us this evening. Um, we will be asked to vote on whether we want uh, constitutional recognition of our First Peoples uh, and giving them uh, an advisory committee, a, a voice to parliament. That's, that's as simple as it is. That, that's what we're going to be asked to vote on. Uh, and we are living in a moment of history. We're making history. You know, we're making history just by being here tonight, by having this conversation. We are part of history, a very exciting part of history. Um, the, the walks for yes was an incredible moment in our history. Rachel, what, was, what were the walks like over the weekend? I, I, and I'll just let you, let you both have, have your final uh, say, but I'd like to know what that was like. Oh, it, it just filled me with great hope. And whatever happens, those, you know, 30,000 people walking down that street was just a wonderful, remarkable moment, wasn't it? Brian Ahrens is here. He's been a great supporter of Indigenous people. It was a... Brian will remember many occasions, the bridge walks that he helped put on in 2000. Um... You know, it was amazing. It was amazing. And um, there's so many Australians of goodwill out there. Um, I want to say two things to finish. One is, is that, as you can see, it's a huge task and getting to 18 million people is very difficult. We've got quite a few volunteers in the room. Put up your hand if you're volunteering. Oh, wow. That's quite a number. So thank you because all of your work makes such a difference. But we certainly can't do it on our own and it's going to be really tough. So we need people to step in, even like for two hours on a weekend and door knock. I've done, I've done door knocking. It's actually really great. It's a fun thing to do. Um, you don't need to be an expert and you'll have some great discussions and you'll feel really good about yourself because come October 15th, you'll go, oh, I made an effort to try and get this across the line. So it's, it's a great thing to be able to do. You don't have to door knock, you can do other things. Anyway, Yes23 website has all the details if you want to... And, and don't think you need to be an expert, you know. I'm far from an expert myself. I wanted to just also um, uh, give you a little joke. <laughs> because um, I was reading the comments section and I was trying to explain on the ABC um, what colonisation is and the process of colonisation and what that means. Anyway... Uh, there was like, I got quite a lot of uh, th thumbs down and, and then I read the comments. And, you know, they were mostly all pretty derogatory and appalling and it made me feel like tonight when I was getting dressed, like what will I wear, you know, what are they going to think of me, you know? And I was thinking, you know, I was trying to think, oh, how can I come across as good as I possibly can, you know, to these people? 
Anyway, there was one comment that I have to share with you. <laughs> because, blackfellas, we really good. Something that helps us keep going is our humour, right? It's been our defining feature in all of our hardship is our future. So you have to share a laugh with me at this because this was one of the funniest racist comments I got. <laughs> this guy says, oh, yeah, Rachel Perkins, her father, he was another one of those abo racists. <laughs> and I was just like, abo racists. I've never heard that before put together and I had to have a laugh about that. Because it's the, what do you call it when it's like a contradiction? It's oxymoron. It was the funniest oxymoron I've heard. So I just let you share that, the abo racist, uh, with all you people as we go forth. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and talk about put, talking about putting it all on the line, um, my colleague at NITV, John Paul Janke, um, said, yeah, told us a story on the weekend, uh, just on the weekend, he was listening to a group of people having lunch and they were, they were grasping at the concepts of the voice and what is this voice and if you don't know, vote, all these things. And he couldn't help himself and, and he um, said, and, and he said, excuse me, I just, I can't help, couldn't help but over here. I, I know a little bit about, about the voice. And, and then he, so was, he spent 20 minutes explaining what the voice to, to this group of people were uh, was and they said that it was the best 20 minutes of their lives. That, that's what they were, uh, that's what they that's what they said. It was the most um, concise information. So because he's done it, now I have to do it. So I, I'm waiting, I'm waiting to overhear a conversation uh, where everyone's confused and I'll be able to insert myself, excuse me. And I, I just, I should just be able to whip out a pamphlet. That would be um, quite good to have some information pamphlets. Uh, Julian, your final say. Well, I, I want to start by thanking Rachel for her amazing leadership of this campaign. And Rachel, I, I've appeared on a range of different panels um, uh, since I've uh, uh, been involved in the campaign this year. And I say that this is a matter about which reasonable people can, can disagree. And we're all good Australians, and that's true. But at the end of the day, um, I'm not on the ballot paper, none of us are on the ballot paper, but in some respects this is a matter that is very specific to Indigenous Australians and as I've sat in panels and so on, I've seen hard questions being asked and I've gone and batted them away, but I've seen the effect it's had on Indigenous people that have sat on, on panels with me uh, over time and, uh, and I felt through that period, being there as one of the people who's happy to, to bat things away, um, I, I'm, I am where I need to be in this debate, and I just want to say it's a privilege to walk on uh, alongside you. I think the weekend was just amazing. You did such an incredible job organising all of those uh, walks across the country. I've been thinking a lot about my kids recently. I've got to I think about them all the time, actually. It's the nature of being a parent. I've, I've got a five-year-old and a one-year-old, and when I stood down from the front bench, I, I said that I wanted to... Uh, to, to, to be true to my principles here. I didn't stand down for issues of leadership or because I don't like my party. I'm committed to my leader, I'm committed to my party, but I wanted to demonstrate to my kids that it's important to stand for something, even when it might be unpopular and, and even when it costs you, in fact, especially when it costs you. So on the weekend, um, uh, I took um, the kids down, like many parents getting to functions, we were running late. We were running about an hour late. We hopped in the train and uh, I have my 18-month-year-old climbing all over me and uh, my five-year-old on the walk through from Redfern Station to, uh, to um, Victoria Park saying, Daddy, can, we, can I go to the loo? Daddy, can we stop for an ice cream and so on? So it delayed, our, delayed our, our entry. And then we finally got there and we met up with the other people from my community from Barara for years. And I was reflecting on this later and uh, you know, it had been a long walk for James, who's my five-year-old. He's old enough that this will be some sort of memory for him in the future. My 18-month-year-old won't remember any of this, but she'll certainly be able to read about it. But I think for so many of us, this is about what sort of country we want for our kids, what sort of country we want Australia to be in the future. I want to see the gap closed, and I think this is a great way to do this, and I'm proud to stand here. And I ask those of you who, who haven't yet volunteered to be involved in the campaign, Think about your kids, think about the future of the country and get involved because we need you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Julie and Lisa, Rachel Perkins, and thank you to yourselves for coming out tonight and to for this very important discussion. And to Annie Dolly for her welcome. <laughs>